blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood Sing out This is my story This is my song I'm praising my Savior All the day long This is my This is my song, I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, I am my Savior.
in the book of Romans, but we're also going to start over in 1 Corinthians. You know where, right? You know where, that's Colossians, that's not 1 Corinthians, Larry. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? We call it the love chapter, right? And beginning there in verse 4, it says some things, very important things about love, right? And I want us this morning to think about what love is. You know, this week a lot of people are talking about love, thinking about love, trying to display their love and show their love in all these kinds of ways. But here's the deal. The Word of God tells us that God is love. Right? And so, what the world tells us love is, is maybe a little skewed because as we look around the world we see Lots of different things that are called love that don't look anything like God. You see, by saying that God is love, the Bible isn't telling us, take what you know about love and apply it to God. What it's saying is, take what you know about God and recognize that that is love. So, as we look here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 tells us, Love suffers long and is kind, right? Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, it's not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, and look at this next little little passage, or, or little phrase, it says, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. We read that earlier during the um, offering this morning on that video. But listen, most of that stuff, we all can say, yeah, that's loving, that's loving. Patience, yes, that's loving. Kindness is loving. Uh, All those things, yeah, that's great. It's not envious. Yeah, I get that. It's wonderful and all those things. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love is all of that. But one of the things that this morning I want to kind of focus on that's going to relate over to to where we're going to be in Romans chapter 1 says this. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. But love rejoices in the truth. Now think about the world you live in. Consider the world you live in. How many things would God's word call iniquity that today people call love? How many things are there out there today that people talk about and they say, well, why, by you saying that, that's a very hateful thing to say. Even though, it, according to the word of God, it's true. So according to the Word of God, this is true. And according to the Word of God, love rejoices in that which is true. And love never, ever rejoices in iniquity or ungodliness, right? And so this morning as we look over in Romans chapter 1, we're going to continue to talk about this thing we started last week. And it's a very loving thing to discuss. And, and today, I want everyone here to know that we have a great commandment, right? And that great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is likened unto the first, that you should love your neighbor as yourself, right? You remember all the commands that Jesus gave? 
Remember when he said, Thou shalt not. How many times in the New Testament do we see Jesus say, Thou shalt not? He says that very, not very often. He does say you shouldn't, and he didn't necessarily use those words, but he says you shouldn't pray out in public and make a big spectacle of yourself so that everybody will think you're holy. He said, but go and pray in private. He says you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that, but mostly what he tells us in the New Testament is what we are supposed to do, right? We're supposed to love one another, right? We're supposed to be witnesses for him. We're supposed to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and and teach them to observe whatsoever he's commanded us. Most of what he tells us in the New Testament are these things that we are to do, and every single one of them is a way of expressing our love for somebody else. If you are discipling somebody, is, is, is that a relationship type thing? I've told you probably a hundred times in this, a few years that discipleship is an educational process, but it is built on relationship. And that relationship is a love relationship. It's somebody that you love, somebody that you care about, somebody that you are taking the time to invest in. That's a loving thing to do, to invest in another person is loving, right? And so as we think about what it means to love and to help other people and to cause others to grow, as Christians, almost everything you can tell me that God's Word tells us to do, I can tell you that's love. In fact, I can't think of anything that's not loving that God's Word commands us to do as Christians. As New Testament believers, we are to season our entire lives with love. And so as we read this this morning, I want, to, I want you to remember, remember last week? Last week we talked about Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, and, and, and who are we talking about in that? That's right. Fools, right? He says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Right? So don't answer him as if his folly is reasonable, but rather answer him in a way that accords with foolish thought. So don't answer him according to his own folly. Don't answer him as if what he's saying makes sense. Answer a fool according to his folly, as is due his foolish suppositions. Right? And so, well, I said one of the things that we want to do through that is to break a cycle. Break the cycle. That was the title last week. Break the cycle of foolishness. Well, this morning as we continue to look at this cycle of foolishness, I want you to see something uh, that's, that's kind of like a process. It's a spiral. Have any of you ever seen a movie where a ship, you know, especially those old pirate movies and stuff, I think one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies has it, uh, uh, this big whirlpool that starts sucking a ship down into it, and they go around and around and around. And then they eventually get drawn into it and it just sucks them right down. Have any of you ever pulled the plug on a bathtub and watched as the water goes around and gets sucked down? It doesn't go straight down. It kind of spirals. And as it spirals, it goes and it sucks things into it because it's moving faster than the water around it. And it's all pretty neat. Well, that is what foolishness is like. Once you start to think foolishly, or as I would also could kind of characterize it as ungodly, unbiblically, you begin this cycle, and it's a spiral that kind of sucks you deeper and deeper and deeper into it. This morning, and we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 22, and I want you to see this spiral, all right? It's a, it's a, it's a bad thing that we've gotten so accustomed to seeing that we ignore it. But we need to break the cycle. Start caring enough about other people to break the cycle. Caring enough, loving other people enough to recognize that love never rejoices with iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth and be willing to share the truth. So this morning I want to ask you to stand with me. We're in Romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 18. Actually, let's back up just for context. 16, one that we're a little bit more familiar with, all right? And my Bible's flipping pages on me, okay. So in verse 16, a pretty familiar verse, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Right? I think we all recognize that one as, as, as being a, a pretty famous, pretty well known. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We pray that as we look into your word, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would convict us, that we would respond to your conviction, to your word, in accordance with your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, I want you all to know something. I have absolute trust in the Word of God. There's nothing that I read in the Word of God at this point in my life where I'll read it and I say, well, I wonder if that's really true. Was there a time in my life that I might have thought that? Absolutely. Was there a time in your life when you might have thought that? Maybe. But there was a time in my life when I was a I was, well, I wasn't a skeptic, but I was a questioner, all right? I was very curious. I wanted to know that the Bible was actually true. I know a lot of people say, I don't need to know for sure. I believe it, so it's true. Well, I wanted to believe it because it's true, and not say it was true because I believed it, all right? So as I was growing up and I was looking into things, I asked a lot of people a lot of questions. I got some goofy answers. I got some good answers. I got pointed back to Scripture over and over, and say, well, you'll understand this better when you look here, and you'll understand that better when you look there, and those kinds of things. And recognizing that the Bible is a story of God, that it all works together, that in context, those things that might be kind of confusing when you look at the big picture make perfect sense. Like we said earlier, last week and, and, and in other times, the, the cross may seem foolish to men. In fact, according to conventional wisdom, the cross doesn't make perfect sense, right? And we said last week how when those people in in Israel were getting bitten by these serpents and those serpents were crawling around biting them and they looked up at that stick that Moses was holding with the bronze snake on top of it, how could that possibly heal them? Right? If you came up to me today and said, Brother Larry, I think I got COVID. I said, oh, it's cool. Just look at this picture. It'll heal you. You'd say... You're nuts, right? You, you have no sense. You don't understand how viruses work. You don't understand a lot of things. By conventional wisdom, that is foolishness. Now, if that happened, you would be right because I would be showing you something that by my own definition or by my own means, I could say it will heal you, but I have no power to do that. But in this case that you read about back in Numbers, God did have the power to do that, Right? And so conventional wisdom might have told those Jews, don't bother looking at that snake on the stick. That's silly. It's not going to do anything for you. But because God said that it would heal them, it healed them. Because sometimes our conventional understanding and wisdom and reasoning is trumped by God. Okay? That doesn't mean we should throw reason out the window because reason is a gift from God. He gave us logic and He gave us minds that think. But when our mind and our reason contradicts the Word of God, one of them is wrong. And we can know which one it is. Right? Yes, thank you. Julie, come on up here. I'm just kidding. (laughs) We know which one is wrong. 
It's not the Bible. It's not God who is wrong. It's us. It's our conventional wisdom. It's our understanding. There was a time when people thought all kinds of things about the world, and they would say, well, the Bible is obviously wrong because it says that, but we know this. And over time, most of those things have been proven to be wrong and the Bible true. And the things that haven't yet been proven to be wrong and the Bible true just haven't been proven to be wrong yet and the Bible to be true. Like I know a few hundred years ago, a man in Europe decided that the earth was millions of years old. Another man in Europe read those writings and said, wow, that makes perfect sense. From looking at the geology and the geological record, that it seems to make perfect sense that the earth is way, way older than we originally thought it was. And you know what? If the world is that old, it's very possible that as I look at these finches, maybe he's right. And the world is old, and those finches have developed, and they've changed a little bit over time, and there's these ideas that started flowing through his mind, and to him it all made perfect sense. Right? And so Charles Darwin was on the beagle, riding through the world, and he stopped there in the Galapagos, and he wrote this this thing, and he went back home, and he finished writing, and he wrote for years, and they published it, and everybody looked at it and said, wow, that makes perfect sense. And there were so many people in the world that loved the way it looked and loved what it, the message of it, and they got it, and they said, that's great, that makes perfect sense. And so many people today still believe it, right? That the world is millions of years old, that humans did evolve from other primate species, which evolved from other species, which evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved. And if you go back far enough, all the species in the world all have a common ancestor. The problem is... One, it disputes the Word of God. One of them is wrong, right? Other problems are that in the day of Darwin, they didn't know the things that we know now. Most honest scientists today would have a very hard time honestly defending the idea of evolution considering what we know about DNA, considering what we know about the human body, so many mechanisms in our bodies that couldn't possibly have developed over time. They get that now. Even a lot of people, honest scientists, look at deep time, those ideas of millions and millions of years. They look at things like radiometric dating, and they say, well, radiometric dating works this way. Here's the problem with radiometric dating or carbon dating is one of those, is is a type of radiometric dating. When we look at those things and we try to verify them, We say, okay, this is the process of radiometric dating. Let's verify it. How do you verify it? Anybody know? You take a rock, you date it, and see if that date matches the actual age of the rock. How do we know the actual age of the rock? Well, we have to know when that rock was created. Places like Mount St. Helens. Rock was created, right? Back in the 80s. Was it 1980? 80? Yeah. I was just a kid back then, but y'all remember it. Uh, so those rocks were created in 1980, so we can test those rocks and we see it. We know exactly how old they are, and we can look at what the radiometric dating it says. All right? And I want to let you in on a little secret. I've looked and I've looked and I've looked, and I've not found a single time when the radiometric date and the observable known date match. Typically, they're off by hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Because these things are very young, right? If we know how old it is, we, it's, it's pretty young because it has to be in recorded history, maybe a few hundred years old, but a lot of them are 30 years old or less. But they date out at millions of years old. When we take the observable science, observational which is the highest level, and compare it to these theories, they fall short. Now, to choose which one you're going to believe. Because that's, that's what it comes down to. We have to choose which, what, which, which one are we going to choose to believe. Because both of these ideas take faith. Absolutely. They are both faith, faith-based worldview. 
Which one are we going to choose? Because you can't say, well, this one's scientific and that one's faith-based. No, 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 no. They're both faith-based. Because there's no more evidence for one than there is for the other. In fact, in truth, a more honest look at the evidence will lead you toward believing in the Bible even if you don't consider yourself to be a Christian. Here's the deal. There's a spiral of foolishness. When you buy into this, it leads you to this and leads you to this and leads you to this and before you know it, you're sucked into that thing and it's bringing you down. What we see here is this spiral that just gets out of control. And what we read in those first few verses, we're going to look at in just a second, if you follow it to the end of the chapter, it says, even do... <clears throat> even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they, they chose to eject God from their understanding. God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. It's a spiral. They start down this circle and it just keeps going. And verse 30 says they, they become... Well, let's back up. Verse 29, it says what? It says, and they being filled with all unrighteousness, Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. There are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. If you wonder why it is that people who hate the Word of God and love the things that we would call wicked or ungodly, why is it that they constantly may talk to you and try to convince you that your way is hateful and their way is loving because not only do they do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. They want others to do those things as well. Now here... Here's the deal. I'm not telling you you should go out and start hating on this person or hating on these group or hating on that group. That is not what God's Word commands us to do. It tells us to love them enough to tell them the truth in humility, meekness, gentleness, lovingly tell them. But tell them. So many people among us in this world today say, well, I don't want to seem unloving. If your child is walking toward the interstate and you have to get their attention to stop them, is that unloving? Are you going to let that four-year-old walk out there because you would rather him get hit by a semi than hurt his feelings by yelling at him? I'm not telling you to yell at people. I'm just saying you've got you to weigh this out. You've got to recognize that it is way more unloving to remain silent and allow people to get sucked deeper and deeper into this spiral of foolishness than it is to speak up in love, in gentleness, but in authority and in truth. The Word of God is truth. Remember last week we read from John chapter 17 that, that, that Jesus said, what is truth was the question that we, uh, we were asking. And Jesus answered that question in John chapter 17. He says, your word is truth. The word of God is truth. We need to understand that. Believe it. Not hope that it's true, but know that it's true. You are never going to boldly, authoritatively speak the truth of God's word to people if you are constantly wondering whether or not it actually holds up. It holds up. I have spent years studying this book and comparing it to the things that are out there, that conventional wisdom that supposedly has caused some to say, well, God is dead. We no longer need God. We no longer have to have this God out there to create, to direct, to do the things that those ancient fools needed God for. That's, that's a lie. God is not dead. He's very much alive. His Word is very much alive. And I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you? 
Because I know that it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. Not to all who carry it around. Not to all who pretend to believe. But to all who believe. I believe the Word of God. So as we look at this, verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Suppressing the truth is something that is done in unrighteousness. Suppressing the truth is not a good thing. Remember what we talked about with love? Love rejoices in the truth. Suppressing the truth is a hateful thing. It is an ungodly thing. It is a terrible thing. Don't ever be accused or be guilty of suppressing the truth. Be willing to speak the truth. Even if it means somebody might not like it. Because I can go ahead and promise you, somebody won't like it. In fact, a lot of people won't like it. Just like you probably didn't like it at some point in your life. When Dad said, put that down, boy. You're going to get hurt. I ain't going to get hurt. I'm going to, ow! Well, Dad was right. That once. Yeah, I'm sure once he was right. Right? We don't always like to be told the truth. But Dad cared enough about me to tell me to put it down, even though I was foolish enough to ignore him. We need to be loving enough and care enough about people to tell them the truth, even though they may be foolish enough to ignore us. We keep telling them. The truth suppressed in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. You know what that word manifest means? It means it is revealed in them. Those people who are suppressing the truth. Those of us who don't choose to believe that we have a Creator, we are a manifestation of Him anyway. People who spend their lives and dedicate all of their energy to proving or trying to disprove that there is a Creator who, who do everything they can to say that God is dead are themselves made in the image of God. They are themselves proof, walking, living, breathing proof of the Creator. They are a manifestation. What is known of God, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. He is eternal, you know that, right? Where did God come from? He didn't. Well, how old is God? He's eternally old. Well, how does that work? It seems to me that everything that exists has a beginning, right? When did man begin to exist? Well, some say millions of years ago. Some say about 6,000 years ago. But everybody agrees we all began to exist, right? Man began to exist. Earth began to exist. Space began to exist. The universe began to exist. So did God begin to exist? No. No. Because God created time and space and matter and life and love and truth and logic and mathematics and physics. He created everything that there is, right? And part of what He created was gravity, which is a law of physics. You know what another law of physics is? Time. It's a physical property. God created time. In the beginning, that's when time began to exist. But who already existed? God. Because in the beginning, God was already there. Right? God is eternal. Not only is He eternal, He is powerful. His eternal power. To be able to speak the universe into existence is something that is powerful. Only one who is extremely powerful. In fact, we can, knowing what we know of God, define His power this way. It is infinite. His infinite power. Because the Bible teaches us that. 
But even from the first verse in the book of the Bible, we see his, his power here in, in Romans 1. We see the power of God. He's eternal and he has power. And his power is also eternal. He's always had it. It's not growing. He's not getting stronger or weaker. You know, it's not hard for God to do anything. It would be just as hard for God to convince one of you to take your mask off or to put your mask on as it is for God to create the universe or even to destroy the universe. Nothing is hard for Him. He is infinitely powerful. We can't even imagine that. It's hard enough for us to imagine someone who is eternal, who's always been, but to imagine one who is infinitely powerful it just blows our mind. But He is eternal in His power. His power is eternal. He has eternal power and Godhead, divinity, His divine nature. He is God. Cindy and I were reading this morning from Leviticus in, in Leviticus 19. You know how many times in Leviticus 19 He says, I am the Lord? Go look it up. Because I didn't count them. But <laughs> it's a bunch. Every single thing He tells them. He tells them, I am the Lord. He tells them again, I am the Lord. He tells them something else. I am the Lord. Don't do this. I am the Lord. Do this. I am the Lord. Over and over and over. Why does he tell them to do these things? He says, be holy for I am holy. I am the Lord your God. His divine nature gives him the authority to tell us to do or not do whatever he pleases. And it is right always because of his divine nature. There's no saying absolute power corrupts how? Absolutely. And when you're talking about men, you're right. But when you're talking about God, because of His divine nature, you're wrong. He has absolute power, infinite power, and yet He is not in the least corrupt. Why? Because of who He is. And what does it say? They're without excuse. What's your excuse? Well, you don't have one. There is no excuse. Because although they knew God, right, there's no excuse. He says everything's easily seen in the creation, in our own selves, in our lives, in everything about us. We see God. We know God is. The truth is evident. So we have no excuse because Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. There's a, a misunderstanding in the world that somehow if you don't believe that God is, then you aren't under His authority. That's not true. There's this idea that, well, I don't believe in God, so that doesn't apply to me. That's not true. There's this idea that there's uh, uh, most people out there in the world don't believe in God, but then some of us who are the enlightened ones do believe in God. But the reality is that we all, every person on earth, an image bearer of God, knows that there is a God. That's truth. Everybody knows that there is a God. It is manifest in our own selves, in our lives. You know, uh, when, when Ecclesiastes says God, Solomon said, God placed eternity in the hearts of men. Squirrels and, and rabbits and, and earthworms don't sit around wondering what's going to happen in eternity. Only men do that. Because God has made man special. He has placed the idea of eternity in our hearts. He has placed the idea of Himself in in us, we know that He is. Because although they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God. They weren't thankful to Him. But instead they became futile or useless in their thoughts. Their thoughts just turned spiraling down and down and down into uselessness. Their foolish hearts were darkened. It's so funny that in today's world, those who call themselves enlightened are the ones whose hearts have been darkened. And those who would call us fools have chosen to become fools themselves. 
Claiming, it says, professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the non-exchanged, I guess we could say, of the non-corruptible, incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. If you look back in time, you know how many societies, civilizations worshipped animals? You know that in today's world, millions of people still worship animals? Have you ever been to a, a city in India and go up and order a hamburger? I've never been there. I don't know. But I know what they think about cows, and I think that hamburgers are probably hard to find there. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the naturalistic world that worships nature, that worships animals, that worships snowy owls, that worships man. Humanism is the greatest threat to our nation. Secular humanism has grown into this huge religion now. And it is so widespread that it is now not considered a religion. It's considered just the way things are. And then there's amongst that, there are people who uh, adhere to different religions. No. Secular humanism is an, is an ism. It is a belief system. It is a religion. As you look here, they've turned the image of God, the glory of God, and they've changed it for an image made like corruptible man. Humanism. Worshipping animals. Worshipping nature. So many people out there, sadly and foolishly, worshipping that which was not created to be worshipped, but they've exchanged that which was created to be worshipped, or that which was created to worship, right? We're created to worship, and we've exchanged that job for something else. This perpetual usism. We just love us. There's a reason that Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love others. Because if we replace the first with the second, we have failed miserably. God's word is truth. It is extremely loving to share the truth. Love itself always rejoices in the truth. The truth matters. As we continue looking through this, this chapter next week, we're going to see that here's, here's a, 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 an old world example of new world problems. We're going to look in the book of Romans. It was written almost 2,000 years ago. And we're going to see things that we're going to go, man, you could have written that about this city today. You could have written that about this state to this country, to this civilization, this culture that we live in, it's so much just like that. Because you know what? The heart of man has been wicked since Adam and Eve first sinned. In fact, if you look back into Genesis chapter 6, you see that the, every intent and thought of their heart continually was nothing but wickedness. Wickedness is not something new. It's not expanding. It just changes. And it changes back. It's, 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 you know, it's kind of like that pendulum that swings back and forth. Right now, culture loves this group of this kind of wickedness, and at some point, they're going to love this other kind of wickedness. You know, wickedness is, is everywhere. Because people are everywhere. And our hearts are desperately wicked. And so by our own goodness and our own loving nature, we will never, ever, be able to address the problem which lies in our own heart. And that problem is sin. And that problem leads to death. And that death is twofold. It is that physical death that we all fear. But it's something even bigger and it's a spiritual death that we all have already experienced. Separation from God due to sin. Separation is death. Separation from your body is physical death. Separation from God is that spiritual death that needed a cure. Jesus brought 
the answer to that problem. That problem is real. As you look at this and you say, you know, I, I know a lot of us, we love to get into scientific debates. I'm one of you. All right? I love to get into scientific and historical debates. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you. Cindy can tell you. I love it. Hopefully I always do it from a pos position of gentleness and meekness and trying to help someone, but I still love it. But all of this is not saying, hey, prepare yourself to go out and get into debates. What Paul is talking to the Romans about, he's saying, hey, guess what? Look into your own heart and recognize something that you are wicked. And he's wrote this, he wrote this to the church at Rome. right? That's why it's called to the Romans, the letter to the Romans. And in the church at Rome, there were two groups. There were Gentiles and Jews, and there was a whole bunch of both of them. And the Jews kind of ran things. And then the Jews were all kicked out of Rome. And then the Gentiles kind of ran things in the church. And then the Jews got to come back to Rome. And so now you got the Gentiles that have been running things, the Jews who used to run things, and they're all coming back together, and there's dysfunction. Guess what? These churches were full of dysfunction, just like all the rest of the churches that you're going to read about here. And those churches in Rome, they were, they were struggling, and they were having a hard time. And Paul says to the Gentiles, you guys are bad. And then he begins chapter 2 by saying, and you Jews are also bad. You Gentiles are sinners. You Jews also are sinners. And then in chapter 3, he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners, and we all deserve condemnation. But thanks be to God, by His grace, He gives us a gift, which is reconciliation, life. And how does He give us that gift? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right? Jesus is the gift. And life that comes through Him is a gift. His grace causes that gift to be ours. And all we are capable of is just to trust Him. I said earlier, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. That's the truth. That's the Word of God. The gospel tells us that we were created in God's image and we chose to sin against Him. And because of that, we fell. We died. Both physically, spiritually, death has reigned from Adam. But then Jesus came. And all those people from Adam to Jesus, if they trusted in God, God, by God's grace, He gave them hope. He gave them a way to have life. But it wasn't fulfilled until Jesus came. And in perfection, God came to earth. And in perfection, He lived among us and walked among us. And in perfection, He died for us was buried and rose again. And all that he did was done, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, by God, so that through him God could reconcile the world to himself. And he has given to us as his children, those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been made alive again, right? Born again. We've been made alive through Jesus, and He's given to us that ministry of reconciliation. So as we're talking about all of this apologetic ideas, those are for a purpose. It's because we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. So if you're here this morning and you need to be reconciled to God, I promise you, you can be today by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And if you're here this morning and you have already been saved by God and you know that you have life in Jesus Christ, I promise you, you have a ministry of reconciliation. And that happens by loving others enough to tell them the truth of God's Word.